So uh, good morning, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Joe Powell, the Deputy CEO of the Open Government Partnership. Um, and I'd like to welcome um, everyone to this high level discussion um, on beneficial ownership transparency. Um, a big thank you to all of the panelists um, to, who will be speaking today and to our partners and fellow organizers, Open Ownership, the B Team and Transparency International for supporting this important conversation. Um, a quick note that there is simultaneous Spanish to English and vice versa translation. Uh, those instructions will be in the chat and on the slide for everyone. Just um, as at the outset of, of the pandemic earlier this year, um, OGP launched the Open Response and Open Recovery campaign um, to show how open government approaches could help tackle the pandemic, um, ranging from open data um, to open contracting of medical procurement to safeguarding civic space. Um, and a big focus of this campaign over the past few months has been to ensure that the massive stimulus and safety net packages are not lost to corruption and mismanagement and that they actually reach those that need it most. Now, beneficial ownership reform is a critical piece of this agenda. As we've seen from recent leaks and investigative reporting over the past several years, shell companies continue to be one of the main enablers of financial crime. Um, which undermines our democratic institutions and reduces resources for public services like health and education. And some of the countries represented here today, including members of the Beneficial Ownership Leadership Group, are among those who are pushing through important reforms to tackle this, this challenge. Um, this Beneficial Ownership Leadership Group is made up of OGP member countries who have committed to implement ambitious beneficial ownership transparency reforms. Many of you will remember that the first beneficial ownership transparency commitment for a public register was actually announced at an OGP global summit in London by the then UK prime minister. Um, but there are now over 25 OGP members um, who have beneficial ownership commitments in their OGP plans, although there is a lot more to be done on implementation. We hope today's discussion will show concrete examples of how different countries are advancing beneficial ownership working together with civil society, business, and other local partners. And looking ahead to 2021, which is also the 10th anniversary of OGP, I think we have a huge opportunity together to make sure that building more open societies and better democracies is central to our vision of building back better after the pandemic. And central to that should be tackling the systemic inequality and exclusion that's exacerbated by corruption and, and dark money. To moderate this today's event, I'd now like to hand over to Robin Hodes, strategy lead at the B team, and until recently, the very excellent civil society co-chair of OGP. Thank you so much, Joe. It's really a pleasure to be here and to moderate this event. Um, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Robin Hodes, as Joe said, I'm with the B team. We're a network of business and civil society leaders who are aligned around businesses' role in creating a more inclusive economy. And the B team has long worked on issues around beneficial ownership transparency, governance and transparency more broadly. You know, November 5th feels like a kind of random Thursday in our busy schedules, but it's not really a random day or a day to be taken for granted amidst what is a long first wave of the pandemic and for some places, a second wave of the global COVID pandemic. And also two days after a US election that's not decided, but indeed of relevance and interest, I think, to most of the world and to, I'm sure, most of you on the call. And what really looms ahead as we look at this moment is a test for democracy and for several of the, the shared global values and norms that um, connect us to democracy, such as accountability and transparency. And I think that when we look at beneficial ownership, and the issues around it, um, it, it touches as well on these important shared values. So um, on this November day, as some of you approach summer and some of us approach a long winter ahead, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to moderate what's an excellent panel to demonstrate how work continues in spite of, or perhaps because of the pandemic and the conditions that have been created around the pandemic, the fragility that we all see around um, something very fragile, but very important, which are the democratic instincts that drive us towards greater accountability um, and push us to um, create more transparency in order to realize that. 
Now, Joe introduced a little bit about the context in which um, we are right now, and I want to congratulate Open Government Partnership for all the great work it's done to land beneficial ownership in the last few years. We we'll hear from um, some country experiences that reflect that important work. But actually, this has been a group effort over time. There's a lot of organizations from civil society, from business, from governments who've worked extremely hard on this. So where are we you know, on this, on this November day? So I'd like to first introduce um, our panelists very, very briefly. And since we're in gallery view, I hope we can um, get a wave or a very brief hello from them. Then I'm gonna run um, very quickly through the housekeeping and the format for the meeting. Um, and then we'll move quickly into um, our panel itself. So first, um, just to go through the list of, of really um, extremely, uh, I think, interesting and important contributors to today's discussion. We have Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, who's Minister of State in the UK Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, going to talk about the UK experience. The UK, of course, we just heard being the initial um, sort of driver of beneficial ownership transparency, both nationally and globally. We've got uh, Rustam Badassian, Minister of Justice in Armenia, Armenia member of the Beneficial Ownership Leadership Group that was just referred to by Joe Powell. We've got Prince Clem Agba, Minister of State for Budget and National Planning in Nigeria. Um, Prince Clem is on the steering committee of Open Government Partnership along with me. Um, Eduardo Bojorquez, the Executive Director of Transparencia Mexicana, which is Transparency International's chapter in Mexico. We have Elisa de Anda Madrazo, who's Vice President of the Financial Action Task Force, and Ivana Rossi, financial sector expert at the International Monetary Fund. I hope everybody's been able to give a wave or if you want to shout out a hello, now's a good moment. Thank you everybody for joining and to this excellent panel who will return to in just a minute. Um, in terms of housekeeping, um, yeah, I did want to say, as I hope is obvious from the little red button, we are recording this. Um, everything is on the record. We do hope to use this um, in social media and, um, and to make the whole recording available. So please do note that. And we also have um, the opportunity to pick your translation language. So please do look for the button at the bottom and pick the language in which you will either yeah, be listening or potentially speaking. Um, this is only available if you've connected via an app. If you're on the phone, that option won't be available. And perhaps um, last but last, not least, we want to actively use the chat. I know we're all very familiar with Zoom at this point, but please do use the chat. You can enter comments, thoughts, reflections. If you'd like to ask a question, please note there that you have a question and or you could put in the question in case you're concerned that you might have some technical issues and you'd prefer for us to read it out. But I think we really would welcome during the Q&A to hear from you and to hear some other voices and see some other faces. So we look forward to that. Um, because we have six panelists, our idea is to start with a few of them and then take a short break and ask for some questions. Um, so I think that what's really remaining is just for me to say what we think the purpose of the event could be, and then I'm gonna hand off. Um, you know, when we think about the leaks that Joe Powell referred to, and um, we understand that there's going to be a reform agenda that's extremely important, not only during COVID, but looking ahead, we have to think about the accountability of the stimulus and of the spending we are doing. And clearly, um, ownership transparency is absolutely critical to that. So today we want to understand what's the status of this agenda around beneficial ownership, given that we're in the middle of crisis and that we anticipate really an economic rebuild that's going to be extremely challenging to public budgets going forward. Um, what is the role right now and, and, and where's the, the, the energy and the dynamic around the international um, institutions on this issue? of beneficial ownership transparency? Can they be leading the way in terms of standards and reshaping and reconsidering the standards that have been in place? Um, how can international institutions bring this in in terms of um, the financing that they enable? And finally, what lessons can we learn from each other? I mean, in terms of um, national implementation, there's been a lot of experiences made. How can that be shared? Um, what, what are the best lessons learned? What are things to avoid? 
And above all, what kinds of inroads can we make in the coming year when there are gonna be more opportunities for sharing publicly? And perhaps even if we ever meet again in person um, at such opportunities as say the G20, which has focused on beneficial ownership for some time, or even at the UN um, special session of the General Assembly, which is gonna focus on corruption in June of 2021. So with those as our goals for today, and without further ado, I'd like to hand off to Lord Ahmad and ask about the UK's commitment and what the UK hopes to achieve in the coming months and years around beneficial ownership. Lord Ahmad. Well, thank you very much, Robin. And thank you also to Joe for your introduction and inviting me here today. Uh, just as a moment of reflection, as you rightly said, Robin, we're all used to Zoom and meeting as we are today virtually. But I think as we look over the horizon through into 2021, I'm sure I speak for everyone on this call and beyond, that we look forward to the opportunity to engage once again in person. But I would like to begin by thanking the organisers, Open Government Partnership, Open Ownership, Transparency International and the B Team for initiating this important discussion today and for their important work in furthering transparency, anti-corruption and open societies. The work arguably is more important today because of the pandemic that engulfs us, which brings an increased risk of both corruption and indeed the closing down of accountability mechanisms. I would therefore begin my comments by echoing the comments of the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who said recently, and I quote, the response to the virus is creating new opportunities to exploit weak oversight and inadequate transparency, diverting funds away from people in their hour of greatest need. Reflective words, poignant words, but powerful words from the Secretary General. And therefore the global community must do what we can, what we all can do to ensure that transparency and accountability are part of every country's organization's response to the virus. In this respect, I am proud that the United Kingdom government has championed openness and transparency throughout the pandemic and continue to support our international partners in doing the same. And let me also say this, that the UK government will bear down on criminals, kleptocrats and terrorists that abuse our fin financial system and of course the liberal democracies, for example, by using opaque companies. The UK was the first G20 country to launch an open and free to access public register of corporate beneficial ownership in 2016. Since then, the United Kingdom has been at the forefront of international efforts to increase transparency. But works of the past and whatever has been achieved is not enough. We all have more to do. The UK's register of companies has been criticised for poor quality data about company owners. And to address this, we recently published robust plans to strengthen the register with rigorous checks on data quality and also serious consequences for those who fail to comply. Criminals have used anonymous companies to buy property, especially in the heart of our country's capital, London, and disguise the origin of their money. To stop this, the British government would introduce legislation requiring, requiring overseas companies to publish their beneficial owners if the company buys or indeed owns property in the UK. In addition, we are also making progress in addressing the transparency of ownership of companies registered in the British overseas territories. Every British overseas territory is now committed to introduce, introducing publicly accessible registers of company beneficial ownership. And we expect these registers to be in place by the end of 2023. If I may, I recognize the immense effort that's been made by our overseas territories, not least because I have served as the Minister of State for the relationship with our British overseas territories. But also the UK is supporting other countries in responding to COVID-19 transparently and effectively. Our Transforming Procurement Systems project will seek to improve transparency and accountability in the procurement of medical equipment and services. 
We are also piloting this approach in Indonesia, in Mexico and South Africa. And this shows how swiftly we can pivot our programming to address risks emerging from the pandemic. At the international level, the UK government initiated the international campaign on beneficial ownership, transparency, and is part of the Beneficial Ownership Leadership Group. Therefore, this event marks a welcome relaunch of this very leadership group after the enforced hiatus of the last few months. If we are to be successful in the coming months and years ahead, the result will be cleaner, more trustworthy. Global markets and far fewer places will be available for criminals to hide the proceeds of their corruption. And therefore, we must work together. And together, we will endeavor to promote open and free to access registers of company beneficial ownership as the global norm by 2023. And I would like to highlight the importance of the Financial Action Task Force in setting international standards in this important area in order to prevent money laundering and indeed terrorist financing. The ongoing review of the Financial Action Task Force's recommendation 24 concerning disclosure of company beneficial ownership is an important step forward. And I'm pleased the UK's representatives to the Financial Action Task Force are chairing, and I'm sure Elisa will speak more about this later. Individual countries are also taking admirable steps to introduce na national leg leg registers, including fellow members of the Beneficial Ownership Leadership Group, supported by the United Kingdom and our partners. And there's also been noticeable and commendable progress in Armenia, moving rapidly from initial commitments to publishing their first sets of data on the extractive industry earlier this year. And I know we'll be hearing from my colleague from Nigeria, but in Nigeria also, the president signed the new beneficial ownership registry into law this August, making it harder for criminals to use anonymous companies to evade taxation and contribute to illicit financial flows. All of these developments represent real momentum towards making a global norm of beneficial ownership, transparency, and tackling the corruption risks which emerged from the pandemic. Of course, I recognize, as we all do, that every country's context is different. And while public, public registers all remain our desired endpoint, we recognize this is a journey for countries in their own way. But ultimately, we seek from the UK to work with you and stand together with you. We are keen both to share lessons and learn from others in the leadership group. And therefore, looking ahead, I think there are three things we need to prioritize in our work together. Firstly, we need to embed transparency and accountability throughout the Building Back agenda. Implementing the G20's recent call to action on corruption and COVID-19 will be vital in this respect. This includes publishing information on beneficial ownership of companies awarded contracts or receiving public support. And secondly, we need to ensure that governments themselves are open and transparent in the use of COVID-19 funds. I therefore support the IMF's call to countries' governments to, and I quote from the IMF, to spend what it takes, but importantly, keep the receipts. More than 60 countries have now made commitments to the IMF on the transparent use of COVID-19 funds. And therefore, I call on all governments and indeed civil society, including the important role of the media, to support and monitor the implementation of these commitments. And thirdly, I want to highlight the importance of media freedom in ensuring that governments themselves are accountable and transparent. As we look around the world today and over recent years, Appallingly, many journalists have been attacked and even killed. Why? For doing their jobs, for investigating corruption and organized crime. This must end. And therefore, I urge governments to respect media freedom and take action to protect independent journalists who are only doing their job to increase transparency. In conclusion, Whilst COVID-19 presents us with an unprecedented challenge, be it locally, be it nationally, or indeed internationally, I remain confident, we, the United Kingdom, remains confident that by working collaboratively, together, and innovatively, 
we can make the vital and substantial progress that is necessary. Thank you so much. Rodama, thank you so much. Uh, very, very interesting um, conclusions there. And I think from the point of view of civil society, very welcome this real strong defense of investigative journalism and free media as a critical element. I think without the leaks that have accompanied both the good reform process, we would not have had the energy in the last few years. But also for this sort of supply and demand side issue, which is that companies um, receiving help need to be clean and clear and transparent and governments need to be held accountable for how they're spending. So very, very important recommendations. Um, and I'm now going to turn to um, Rustam Badassian, who's Minister of Justice in Armenia. Minister Badassian, the floor is yours. And if I could encourage everybody to please put their questions into the chat so we can come back quickly to the two ministers with questions as soon as he's done. Minister Badassian, over to you. Thank you, Ms. Hodas. Uh, I would like to thank you also Open Government Partnership and Open Ownership for organizing this very important online discussion. It's, uh, of course, very interesting to follow worldwide developments on open uh, government and on accountability and transparency. And, uh, of course, COVID-19 creates many challenges for all our countries in uh, different uh, sectors, including healthcare, social welfare, access to justice, human rights. But even in these challenging times, Armenian government is uh, keen to implement all the actions which were put in the reform agenda of anti-corruption and uh, action plan for 2019 to 2022. And uh, may, may, you may know that uh, anti-corruption reforms is one of the core reform agendas for the new government. And we see uh, beneficial ownership as integral part of our anti-corruption reform agenda. Uh, the first uh, legislative act, uh, which addressed at some extent uh, the issue of beneficial ownership was accepted in 2008 in Armenia and uh, came into force in 2009. Uh, of course, this uh, legislative act, which was uh, about fighting money laundering and terrorist financing, was not uh, introducing proper mechanism of monitoring beneficial ownership information. And moreover, as uh, until recently, recently uh, the Corruption was widespread in Armenia. We had many cases where shell companies were being registered and many cases where uh, companies were registered by fake shareholders. And in reality, PEPs uh, were the beneficial owners of uh, such companies. So uh, moreover, this uh, legislative act even did not introduce uh, that Armenian nationals can be regarded as PEPs. Uh, while having the notion of PEPs uh, apply, applicable only for uh, other nationals. Uh, so other uh, legislative act, and I thank uh, my colleague, uh, Lord Ahmad, for mentioning, uh, uh, for mentioning uh, the developments in Armenia. Uh, we joined in 2019 uh, Extractive Industries uh, Transparency Initiative, and uh, in 2019, we, ex uh, we amended uh, law uh, and introduced a declaration system for uh, companies, for business entities, which uh, operating in uh, extractive uh, industries field. And uh, during the first quarter of 2020, we received the first declarations these declarations are open without any state fee and are published in the official website of public registry uh, of Armenia. And uh, first monitoring uh, and uh, administrative procedures started after uh, submission of the declarations. And we also noticed some uh, deficiencies in the system, which we are trying uh, to, uh, to check and uh, to correct now. Uh, I would like to inform that uh, now we have uh, been drafting the new amendment to the law 
which will introduce uh, the, uh, the uh, submission of declaration of on beneficial ownership in all other sectors uh, of business in Armenia. And we will uh, do it periodically uh, in order to have uh, enough time for different business entities uh, which are operating in different markets to have adequate time uh, to know about their rights and responsibilities and also for the state to have uh, enough time uh, to uh, prepare the online platform for uh, declarations. Uh, another aspect which we are trying to uh, solve uh, by this draft is having very uh, precise mechanism of monitoring and examination of the uh, correctness of the information which is being declared by the companies. And of course, having proper mechanism of cooperation between different state institutions, between the register of business entities and tax authorities, between law enforcement agencies, and of course, financial sector, because we see this as an integral part of the mechanism uh, to work it, uh, to implement these uh, standards in practice. And of course, uh, other uh, problem which we are solving to have uh, adequate uh, sanctioning mechanism, uh, including criminal liability for not submitting declarations, for submitting false declarations, or for uh, false information, or including false uh, information in the declarations. And uh, at the end of my speech, uh, I would like to talk also about the challenge which uh, all of our countries may uh, face uh, on uh, transparency and accountability issues. You may know that uh, now uh, Armenia and uh, Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, unrecognized Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh, are facing uh, large scale large-scale military aggression from the side of Azerbaijan and Turkey. And uh, there is uh, proof and there are statements from France, Russian Federation, United States of America, that foreign terrorist fighters are involved in this conflict. And there are many evidences of war crimes which are being uh, now implemented against the civil population of Artsakh. And I would like to stress out that, uh, of course, it's very important to speak about high standards of accountability, of transparency, to introduce new legislation on beneficial ownership and all other mechanisms which uh, helps us to fight uh, money laundering and terrorist financing. But we need to know that even if minimum standards are not addressed by countries, we will have real challenges as our societies will not expect, uh, will not accept all these changes and will not believe that all these amendments are necessary for effective fighting against money laundering and terrorist financing. So I hope that uh, all our efforts and all our joint efforts uh, will be implemented in practice and we will have adequate also monitoring systems uh, for uh, against different countries who refuse, not only refuse to uh, accept and implement minimum standards, but also they themselves are involved in financing terrorism. Thank you very much for all, uh, for uh, again, organizing this uh, discussion and I uh, wish fruitful discussion to all the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Badassian, and thank you for setting the context there. We would now like to go to questions, and I've got the first one from Chip Cottrell, if he can come on the line. While we wait for him, perhaps I'll just pose one to both of you. Um, you know, if there was one aspect of the work that you've done so far, um, that you'd like to highlight as most relevant for others, really the, the I'd say the country level work, perhaps above all, what would it be? First to you, Lord Ahmed. Well, thank you for that, Robin. Gosh, it's one of those questions you look around uh, and say, right, what element? But bearing in mind the forum today, it seems entirely apt that one really effective tool and experience of the UK 
uh, sort of insight in this has been the UK's register of people with significant control. When this register was first launched back in 2016, UK media and civil society groups actually all got together with data scientists over a weekend. And what did they do? They interrogated the register and they identified problems, problems like how the data was being collected, examples of how companies may be able to evade the law, if I can put it that way. And as I said earlier in my opening comments, it's all about transparency and we have a lot of work still to do on, on the register and company transparency and being held accountable by civil society, by the media, in my mind, is one of the most invaluable tools for progressive democracies, inclusive democracies, but those really focused on tackling corruption and companies who may seek to evade the law. And our own experience, just to sort of sum up, is that their work, their analysis, their sort of reviews have led to Companies House here in the UK making changes to improve the register and have contributed to the robustness of the register and a recognition of the success of the register. And I have a few stats here just for you. Our register is now accessed over 9.4 billion times a year, and it's estimated to be worth up to three billion pounds to the economy. So therefore, in summing up, transparency and accountability, we talk about it a lot, but we must also to ensure there's a whole of society approach where governments themselves, sometimes it's not comfortable, but we're held to account for what we introduce to ensure that those two combined objectives can be met. Thank you. It's really um, important, I think, to hear the value of that um, as seen by government and as seen by business. And Minister Badassian, what has been your key learning that you would share given your journey on beneficial ownership? Uh, thank you. Beneficial ownership is something uh, new for Armenia. So I think uh, uh, the thing we managed to resolve during this time to have uh, transparency in the field of extractive industries and to have a basic information on beneficial owners uh, as declared by themselves. And I think this is initial information which can be later checked and examined by different other authorities. And we hope to resolve all other problems in this area by the new legislative package, as I mentioned. Thank you for that. Um, and great to hear about the progress and also the way you're bringing those reforms together. I'd like now to go to the audience. Chip Cottrell, you ready? Uh, thank you, Robin. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good. Thank you, both Minister and, and Lord Ahmad. I appreciate uh, your engagement as well as your, um, your remarks uh, more broadly. I, I've got a question about the carrot versus the stick scenario. Um, and uh, what do you believe, uh, Lord Ahmad, uh, are the most effective within the, 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 the network um, that you're operating within? Um, and how effective do you think that's going to be? And w w perhaps comment on the challenges uh, to that. And, and Minister, I'd also be interested in your uh, feedback in, in that regard as well. Carrots and sticks. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's um, the carrot also works internally. I alluded earlier to the work we've done with our overseas territories. There's two ways to look at it. We, with the relationship we have with some of our jurisdictions, can either impose things or get people to walk with you and come together. And I, through my own business experience of 20 years or as a government minister, know that's far easier when you bring people together and work with them. So I would say that part of the carrot is, is ensuring that, um, and that there are benefits to be had because you can contribute to the kind of rules, regulations, and indeed timetable that is set as I said in my opening remarks, that countries are moving at different uh, scheduling and different uh, timings. But nevertheless, if you bring them in at an early stage, it allows them to contribute. By not doing so, they will then have to deal with the end product rather than being able to influence um, how that product in itself or the timing of that and its introduction looks. And in terms of the, you know, the benefit of that is that companies that are operating within that environment, those companies that come forward themselves who act according to the rules, will feel that they'll be able to get on their business, on with their business without 
um, further ado and without any hindrance. In terms of the stick, that also matters. To those companies, there's a simple message. If you don't comply, there will be sanctions against you. And I think the communication of whatever those penalties or sanctions must be, must be also very clear, and it must be a whole of society approach. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Uh, we have some concerns from uh, the side of private sector also in Armenia after we put into public discussions the legislative package. And uh, I think uh, having periodically uh, implementation of the uh, package for different sectors is uh, the key to success. And also having very uh, easy mechanism of submission of the declaration and not to create a problem for uh, business entities. It must be very easy, very accessible. And I think these are uh, the main points, nothing to add. Thank you very much. We'll take one more question from Helen Darvisher, and then we'll go on to our next panelist. Helen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Helen Darbyshire, Director of Access Info Europe, uh, based in Madrid, and a member of the OGP Steering Committee. Um, so someone who's been working, and I am working on the issue of company registered transparency and beneficial ownership transparency. And it's fantastic to hear the experiences from the European region, at least from the UK and Armenia. I know we're going to hear from, from other parts of the world as well. Um, there, there was a lot of work done to include uh, in the EU's rules, uh, the anti-money laundering directive, uh, to include a commitment to open up beneficial ownership registers. And as we've heard, uh, it's, there's also been commitments over the years to open up company registers more broadly. And yet we're not really seeing that converted into uh, the actual opening of these registers in practice. And we're now seeing resistance from some governments, on, including Germany, on the grounds of protection of personal data um, and the idea that we cannot know the names of the people. And as we've heard both from Lord Ahmad and from Minister Badassian, it's absolutely essential to know the actual names of people if we're going to be able, if these, these registers are going to be meaningful. So my question is two part, how do we address better the personal data protection concerns argument? Uh, and the second one is how do we really generate enough momentum and get more of the large countries uh, in the European region or in other parts of the world on board in the opening of these registers? Because it seems to me that for all of the work that, the, that has been done, we're still going a little bit slowly on this. Um, and we've got some fantastic examples here today, but not enough of them yet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. A very important dynamic between um, the call for openness and the very, um, I'd say numerous constituencies who've said this data really has to be in the public domain versus issues of privacy. And do we have to see it as either or? Over to the two of you. Let's start with Minister Vadasian first. So uh, I am for transparency. So every time which uh, when we uh, start discussion of uh, legislative initiative by the Ministry of Justice, there is a discussion ongoing uh, discussions about uh, data privacy. But uh, I think that uh, state registers, which uh, shall be open largely for the public, must uh, have uh, open and closed uh, parts of the declaration. And I think every uh, part which may raise concerns on data protection shall be protected by the law, but it shall not affect the transparency overall. Uh, the Republic of Armenia is for transparency. The current government is for transparency. And if EU initiative uh, will be also for non-EU members, I think we will be, we will be the part of the initiative. Thank you for that resolute <laughs> response. And Lord Ahmed, I know you've stuck with us uh, for longer than you thought you could. So the final word on this one is yours. 
Yeah, so it's always good for ministers to stay the course. Um, otherwise, you might be accusing me of diving out of difficult questions, and that, that's something which I, I didn't want to either give the impression, nor is it my intent. But no, very briefly, I think it, it, I agree with the minister. There is a, a balance to be struck, and what you've just said, Robin, as well, it's a, it, it, it's a challenge because you have to adhere to data protection rules, which are important to protect the genuine interests and concerns of individuals in this respect. But I think the commitment to fighting um, corruption, illicit finance, and ensuring full transparency means that events such as this, where governments participate with civil society, are welcome in moving the agenda forward. Helen mentioned that the pace is not what it should be. Um, I feel that the current pandemic also lends itself to perhaps slowing the pace rather than quickening the pace. So we have to be real to that. But I think there is an international commitment given. We've talked about global standards and a level playing field being reached by 2023. And we need to ensure that whether we're talking through fora such as this or indeed through bilateral exchanges, government to government or in international engagement. And I think the role of the FATF is going to be important in this. We're raising these issues to ensure that those global aspirations and commitments that were made to openness and transparency, um, governments do fulfill them in the dates and the timings that have been set. We've certainly been working towards that in terms of our own accountability, the legislation we've introduced on um, the money laundering directive, the opening of uh, and commitment from our British overseas territories to public registers. Uh, I'll be very clear, it wasn't easy. Uh, you know, the discussions were pretty tough, but the fact is that you've got to commit to doing something. But I would add this caveat, that you must do it in a reasonable time scale. It's very easy to say, we must do this by the end of the year. But you know, I worked in financial services for 20 years myself. So I have an understanding that to take people with you, you need to ensure that the dates you're setting, the targets which are being laid out are realistic and achievable. Otherwise, all it becomes is a statement of intent. What we need now is delivery. But thank you so much. Um, my, I regret I have to bow out at uh, this occasion, just the challenge of diaries that is, but I really welcome the opportunity to participate. And I look forward to working with other partners on this important agenda going forward. But thank you for allowing me to participate today. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to, to further conversation, including possibly at the G7 next year. So let's turn to our other panelists. Um, we're very, very grateful for the first two kicking us off. And I think that given the timing, I'd like to go through all four of them, but ask them to be a bit briefer than they plan to be so that we can hear from them. And then we can kind of juxtapose the insights they'll offer us from country level experience um, with beneficial ownership reform, how the issue is doing, progress and challenges, and then we can look at it in the international context as well, and then come back to all of you for further questions. Now, I think the chat's been a bit quiet, so I wanna encourage everybody to put in, who are you, where are you from, what are you working on relating to this issue? Send us links, send us ideas, and above all, send us questions. So without any further ado, I'm really delighted to turn over to Prince Clem Agba. Um, also entered um, the, the public sector, I hope I can say, with a strong experience in the private sector and bringing that experience to bear. So Clem, over to you to talk about the context of COVID-19, the reforms you're taking on in Nigeria and, and where you are in terms of um, your progress on beneficial ownership. Thanks, Clem. Yeah, thank you, uh, Robin, and uh, good afternoon from uh, Nigeria. Yeah, for us in uh, Nigeria, beneficial ownership uh, transparency is uh, really, really essential to open response and open recovery uh, efforts uh, at combating between economic and health uh, pandemic uh, that has been posed by COVID-19. Uh, like we all know, uh, vast amount of resources running into trillions of uh, dollars we are mobilized uh, and allocated to tackle this uh, twin pandemic, as I like to call it, across uh, the world. Globally, uh, citizens' trust in uh, government requires improvement. And in Nigeria, uh, the, the trust gap uh, between the citizens and uh, 
and the government is really, really huge. And so government sees it as its uh, responsibility to help to bridge uh, that uh, gap and to ensure uh, that that uh, gap doesn't grow further or deteriorate. I mean, in terms of the, the trust with uh, government, we tried during the pandemic to have very robust engagement uh, with citizens, especially as we were reviewing the, the initial 2020 uh, budget and trying to put in place a stimulus uh, package uh, to help the recovery of the of the economy. So we uh, in Nigeria are committed to disclosing uh, the budget uh, details, uh, procurement, payment and audit information while reassuring citizens that utilization of funds is done in a value driven manner. Our disclosure effort, especially with the disclosure of beneficial owners of companies, we show citizens those behind companies awarded contracts and ensures avoidance of conflict of interest. Procurement during a time of state of emergency as this has very high risk of corruption. And it is important to mitigate this corruption risk by disclosing as much information as possible, including the information about those behind companies handling contracts for, for government. To respond to the pandemic, we have had to fall on emergency procurement of medical supplies and equipment and procurement of palliatives to vulnerable citizens in Nigeria. We have also had calls to borrow from bilateral and donor partners to prevent the total collapse of the economy occasioned by the impact of the pandemic. To ensure effective utilization of all financing arrangements related to Nigeria's response to the pandemic, we have taken the following steps. Uh, one, we had had to revise the 2020 federal budget to respond effectively to the realities of the time and immediately secure legislative approval while remaining engaged with the civil society and the public. In the revised uh, 2020 budget, we created a 2.3 trillion COVID-19 intervention fund to act as a stimulus for the economy. And this was published in our economic sustainability plan with breakdown of planned utilization of the fund. Nigeria's Bureau of Public Procurement also issued an emergency procurement guideline that mandates disclosure of all procurement information on Nigeria Opal contracting portal, which we call NOCOPO, at the end of every procurement process. Though Nigeria's procurement law says all procurement information should be made public at the cessation of emergency period, with open contracting, we expect procuring agencies to impute such information on the portal as soon as each project procurement ends. This disclosure will include Has everybody lost Clem? Oh, Prince Clem, we had a few problems there. Perhaps you could just back up a little bit. Okay, can you Thank hear you me lost now? You from, yes, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, so pres uh, President uh, mandated that all payments above uh, 5 uh, million Naira are published on the Open Treasury platform and made the Open Treasury platform adoption compulsory for all COVID-19 expenditure. This ensures that the public has an open access to track all payments to ensure effective utilization. We also committed to the IMF uh, to audit all emergency response expenditure and related procurement processes. The audit finding will be published at most six months after each fiscal year and by our independent audit institution, which is the Office of the Auditor General of the Federation. These steps will ensure that Nigeria's response to recovery from the pandemic is open and transparent. In addition to these steps, 
we recognize that beneficial ownership will improve our efforts to ensure transparent implementation of recovery efforts. So let me speak briefly about Nigeria's uh, beneficial ownership transparency uh, commitment. Uh, when I assumed the uh, office about a year ago, I received a brief on the importance of a full implementation of our commitment to build an open register of registered companies. I engaged the Corporate Affairs Commission to discuss ways we can fully implement the commitment. We work to secure the signing of the Companies and Allied Matters uh, Act 2020, and we have begun engaging with stakeholders to gather user requirements as a prelude to developing the register. The beneficial ownership provisions in the new Companies and Allied Matters Act 2020 aligns with the beneficial ownership disclosure principles. Uh, the Corporate Affairs Commission and other partners contributed to the effort of open ownership in the development of the disclosure principles. What we're, we are doing, we are actually modeling our own register after the UK version and have commitment from the UK Companies House to support our Corporate Affairs Commission as we design and develop this register. Like I said, we have passed the required legislation on beneficial ownership. We are consulting stakeholders both within and outside of government to gather user input in the design process. With the support of the Open Ownership Partnership, we have redesigned our annual returns form submitted by registered companies at the end of each financial year. This form requires beneficial owners and companies to attest to the accuracy of their submission to the CAC. Uh, we have already launched a register for the extractive sector and, we, and work will begin on a broad register at the end of the year. Uh, furthermore, I have received the mandate of the Nigeria's multi-stakeholder forum to work uh, the Corporate Affairs Commission to secure the approval of the president to join the beneficial ownership leadership group and formally sign the beneficial ownership disclosure principles. So in the next uh, few weeks, I hope to convey the president's approval of Nigerians membership, of the beneficial ownership leadership group and signing of the beneficial ownership disclosure principles. So as COVID-19 response spending by governments around the world increases, especially uh, under emergency governance framework. It is extremely important to closely monitor not just the form, but processes set out in the emergency guidelines. Effective monitoring begins with disclosure of all information, including beneficial owners of the companies uh, involved. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you very much, Prince Clem. That was um, a great reveal, the kind we like on this, uh, this event um, to find out about Nigeria's uh, intention to join the Beneficial Ownership Leadership Group, a wonderful piece of news. Um, and thank you for outlining the important link to procurement. And I don't think that's the last we'll hear about that on this call today in discussion between ownership, transparency and procurement, extremely important in these times of um, crisis financing and crisis procurement. Now, Eduardo Bajorquez, I'm gonna to turn to you. I know you have experience um, watching governments um, bring reforms into place and, and providing um, civil society feedback on those kinds of reforms. Can you reflect for us on Mexico's experience with beneficial ownership? Over to you. Thank you very much, Robin. I'm gonna speak from the civil society perspective, but normally when I do so, I refer to, to our country, and sometimes it may seem that we are talking from the government perspective, no? but this is a common effort from civil society and governments. Thank you again for the kind in, invitation to join this seminar, this, this uh, uh, conversation. It's really great to see some of you, well, most of you, all of you, well and sound, and, and some friends again. Um, Mexico has been an early adopter of the idea of a beneficial ownership. I, I can say 
Elisa will correct me maybe, but since 2016, no? when, once that we heard that there was a international discussion about beneficial ownership, Mexico uh, took that idea as part of the, 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 the national uh, endeavors uh, regarding transparency, access to information, anti-corruption and uh, money laundering and other issues. Uh, despite being the, an early adopter of this idea and being part of every single international uh, coalition to support the idea, Mexico is part of, of the beneficial ownership leadership group. Uh, it, it has been an, an open uh, promoter of the idea in the G20. Uh, we have been joining forces with TI. Uh, Ivana Rossi maybe is going to reflect on this, no? on, on the on the openness of the IMF in terms of the rescue packages and, and resources in, invested. Uh, we, we have been um, struggling to, to really have one very concrete public and open register of beneficial ownership in Mexico. We are part of all the conversations we have been, uh, including for instance, uh, beneficial ownership register in our national action plan for the open government partnership. We, we are also part of EITI. And we can say that uh, as uh, a few minutes ago was told that, that contracting in Mexico has been also included the discussion of beneficial ownership. So what's what's happening? And, I, I, and probably this is the moment to, to, to ask the question. My first guess is that these are fragmented efforts. No? Uh, the Financial Intelligence Unit is working very close with the FATF no, in terms of the recommendation. Mexican Congress is discussing legislative changes that are addressing most of the recommendations of the F FATF. Uh, we have the OGP, we have EITI, but you know we, we don't have a, 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 a common conversation. We are having several different conversations about this issue and we are um, in, in these fragmented efforts, probably duplicating a lot of the things that have to be done just once. So uh, my very humble proposition here is that maybe we, we should have one single conversation about how to have a beneficial ownership public and open register, including all the relevant stakeholders, including all the, the different interests that are uh, around this issue and we don't have it, no? And that's probably the most uh, urgent issue to, to, be, to be addressed in Mexico right now. We, we need one, thing, a, a one comprehensive, intelligent conversation so we don't waste time. And that's probably the second, the second challenging thing for Mexico, which obviously being a G20 comp, a country, a major global player in terms of economics, a, a global player right now in, in the discussion of the vaccine, no, the global vaccine, we, Mexico and Argentina are, are uh, uh, you know, working together to have, uh, to, to push for, for, uh, for the new vaccine uh, in, the, in the next months. I think we, we need to address time in a different way. Uh, as the uh, uh, a recent report that was disclosed by the Gates Foundation showed, uh, the world lost 25 years of development in only 25 weeks. So if we're going to address that, no, we need to start working in a different pace uh, for tools as important as the beneficial ownership public registry. No, we, we don't have time to be wasted right now. We need to, to start thinking in a different rhythm and uh, unlock the brakes. No, we have so many brakes uh, trying to, to, to refrain from, from providing concrete results in these issues and we need to unlock them. Uh, I, I think we have to be very clear uh, that, that Mexico, uh, if they want to achieve everything that they have committed internationally and locally, they have to unlock the brakes. And we need to have in a very limited time, version beta, if you want to say so, of a public registry. And I, uh, and I think it's possible. No? We, we have been part of the discussions. We, we know that there is a lot of interest. Uh, the head uh, of the Financial Intelligence Unit, is a, it's an open guy, Elisa, no? you know him. Uh, he's really pushing for the beneficial ownership uh, agenda. Uh, the Ministry of uh, Public Administration is also very outspoken about this issue. So no, this is the time to you know, uh, provide results and concrete results 
connected to a very sensitive issue, which is economic recovery for our country and for the world in the next the next month. So, uh, basically, two 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 very simple things. No, we we need to share a coffee. It doesn't matter if it's virtual, uh, uh, but we need to start talking one single conversation, uh, uh, address the fragmentation of these efforts. And secondly, we need to, to have a new renovated time uh, framework for addressing this issue. No? If we lost 25 years in 25 weeks, maybe we can have a beneficial ownership register in 25 weeks as well. So uh, uh, that's, that's the situation from Mexico um, and probably it's, uh, it's common to other countries in the world. Thank you very much again, Robin. Thanks, Eduardo. I have a quick question for you. The fragmentation point's very clear. What's the one thing that's stepping on the brake right now? Can you name it? Well, I, I think, um, it, think about OGP, for example. No, this is a very clear example. Our national action plan was drafted before the coronavirus crisis. No? So we were thinking about two years period no? for the discussion of this kind of issues. No, we, we, we had the, the, the previous pace of the world no? included in most of the planning. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the AFTF no, has a, a, a well, it had a different uh, framework. You know, things have been programmed for many years now. And maybe we have to address that. No, we, we need to start thinking that uh, instead of waiting two years for a national action plan to deliver results in OGP, we need to unlock the brake no? and say, well, these are very crucial things for Mexico and the international community right now. And we don't have the, the benefit of waiting for two years for having a result no? uh, when we're having these kind of discussions. Uh, so maybe it's it's a it's a discussion about time, Robin. No, what, what, okay. which is the right time framework for all these efforts to happen? Think about the beneficial ownership leadership group. No, it's which is very important. And now we have heard that Nigeria is joining the group. No, it's very important. But the the time framework does doesn't match the reality of the world right now. No, we're we're still thinking uh, in you know in the previous uh, logic of of things. And uh, we're not addressing that, no? the planning. Just a very simple example. The other issue, obviously, is the political economy. Each group has you know, different interest groups, compositions, and they are fighting for common things, but they have their own stakeholders, their own counterparts. No? And, and sometimes you know, we are simply uh, pro, you know, discussing this in circles. No? Uh, from the EITI perspective, from the uh, OGP perspective, from the AFTF perspective, which is relevant, but sometimes, you know, a register, a public register is just a public register, no? Regardless of how many stakeholders has to serve. And, I, and I'm, I'm not naive, uh, you know, I'm, you know me, Robin, no? This is not my naivete and optimistic uh, uh, side uh, talking, no? Th this is, we need to rethink the whole way we are, we are discussing these kind of things and the pace for reform. Thanks, Eduardo. That's really clear. And I think the, the pandemic as, as a way to unlock some of our own, um, yeah, perhaps too timid, perhaps too cautious approaches to change and to reform. Um, from Mexico to Mexico, Elisa de Anda Madrazo, speaking on behalf of the Financial Action Task Force. You know, you're really putting a human face on an organization that people don't know very well, but have heard a lot about. So it's great to have you with us. And if you could explain a little bit about FATIF's key role here, but also what's uh, in the pipeline and how this moment is perhaps also um, warming up action on the Financial Action Task Force. Thank you, Robin, and good day to everyone. Good morning to my side of the world. It's a pleasure to be with you today and to speak after Eduardo. Uh, we both share a nationality and we go way back as well. And that gives me the opportunity just to clarify that today I will be speaking on behalf of the FATF, for which I hold the vice presidency. So while I am a public servant, uh, a proud public servant in my country, today I will refrain from making judgments or comments on the work of my jurisdiction as it might take me into a conflict of interest. But I do take note, Eduardo, of your um, 
suggestions and, and we can talk bilaterally after, after this forum. So with that, thank you for inviting me to the Build Back Better event. It is good to see all these partner organizations and representatives of the government getting together in supporting this very relevant agenda on BO and transparency. I am here, as I said, in representation of the Financial Action Task Force. And this is an organization that was created in 1989. We are the lead organization in fighting money laundering and terrorist financing by setting the standards for the jurisdictions and by assessing how they comply with these standards. In our global network, we have over 200 jurisdictions, 204. So we truly, we truly set a floor, global floor, to fight these very relevant financial crimes. And in fact, in 2003, the Financial Action Task Force was the first organization to set standards in relation to beneficial ownership. These standards were revised in 2012. And while they were set to fight money laundering and terrorist financing, it is proven that they also help in fighting the predicate offenses. The predicate offenses are those crimes that bring the illicit funds for them to be laundered, such as corruption and tax evasion. So that's why our work at the Financial Action Tax Board is so connected with the work that you are doing on beneficial ownership and transparency. They go hand in hand, and I'm very glad that we are having this conversation together, and I would like to foster more of this um, exchange of views and working hand in hand in the future. Future. So I am, I am not here to give you only good news or to tell you that we have found the clue or the best standard on how to do this. There are things that are going right and there are things that are going wrong and that need more work and in which we have to work together. And this is where I would really like to focus on. So what is going right is that we see that jurisdictions are implementing changes based on the recommendations to their legal framework to their regulation. So let's say the technical part of the standards are being implemented by the jurisdictions. But now the tricky part and where we see a lot of challenges and where things are not going frankly as well is the implementation, the effective implementation of the standards. So this is when you actually put your legal framework, your registry or any other institutions or uh, frameworks that you have into work and that you have to show results. In fact, we assess 11 areas of the government and the results they're giving in, in their effectiveness and BO grades second to the lowest one. So this is truly an area where countries are struggling and where the FATF is therefore working more to see how we can better support the jurisdictions in giving more results and better results. So what we did is that after uh, issuing a guidance in 2014, we got back to the jurisdictions and look at the assessment through the fourth round. And we noticed that they, there was need to work more on giving um, case examples and best practices on how to do the work on BO. So we requested the jurisdictions of the global network to provide case examples and best practices. And we actually just issued last year, at the end of last year in October, 2019, a document on best practices. And it's very interesting because what we see is that well, we give flexibility to the countries on how to do the implementation of the standards. Within that flexibility, we have seen commonalities of what is actually working well. And what we see is that a multi-prolonged approach, a multi-dimensional approach on how to gather the information for BO is what is working best. This is a very technical matter. So you can actually consult the document in more depth, but just to give you um, a little bit of flavor of what this looks like. The FATF provides flexibility for the jurisdictions to go for a registry approach, for a company approach, or for an existing information approach. And countries should use one of these mechanisms to ensure that the information on BO uh, of the company is obtained and it's available for the authorities within the country. What we're looking is that the country, what we're seeing is that the countries that are actually combining these approaches two or the three of them are giving best results. So we are rethinking the way we can do this and putting this to the, to the, to the public knowledge, if this is helpful, if, if learning from a true global picture on how the development is going. 
please do consult the document and engage with us in a conversation. I, it's interesting that you say that there's usually not a face for the FATF. We're working on that, on reaching out, on having more engagement with the private sector, partner organizations, and not only the government, because at the end, that is where the key success of a true implementation lies. So uh, happy to continue with this. Now, I know there's a lot of interest in looking, interest in looking into how the pandemic is affecting the, the fight and they work on BO. So I would like to give you some flavor on this. When the pandemic started, we asked all jurisdictions to send information on how this was changing the risk and the trends. So I looked at, at this information and tried to gather the one that is related to BO. And what I can tell you that some of the risks that the jurisdictions are reporting to us is that a lot of business are gonna go into bankruptcy. A lot of business are looking into having to close or sell. And these are businesses that were legitimate and legal. So crime or corrupt officials could take over these licit um, mask of um, businesses to conduct and mask their operations. So this is something, a, a true risk that we're seeing during the pandemic. Also, the private sector is having more difficulty in implementing the CDD, the customer due diligence measures. And this is, has to do with the remote work and other, other type of situations that we're facing right now, which makes their work more difficult. And therefore, the accuracy and the update of this information not, might not be high in quality during the pandemic, which as we know, continues. And there's no, it's not a moment where we can talk about post COVID. We're talking about the situation that is prolonging and we have to adapt as Eduardo suggested. So while our work can change, the mission of what we do should not be compromised. So we, we, have, to, we have to adapt. The other thing that we see is obviously all the stimulus and all the money that the government is putting into um, recovering the economy and boosting the economy. And certainly legal persons are being used to request these types of funds and to conduct basically fraud and attain these funds. And also corruption, because the government has to spend a lot of money, they have to spend it quickly. And a lot of the back checks and balances that are there to, to make sure that there's no corruption are not being conducted with enough time. So as you said, there's a suggestion to keep the, the receipts for the money spent, but still we cannot put um, the, our feet out of the gas pedal at this moment. We cannot go in neutral because this is when our work becomes more relevant. And we do see, and I wanna highlight this uh, for the last part of my intervention, we do see and have concern that the, both the private sector and the public sector are taking away resources from the agenda of anti-money laundering and terrorist financing, which includes work on BO, and they're moving it to economic recovery and the health, the health measures. So while this is understandable, there is a call by the FATF, which has also been uh, done by the G20. And I, that's what I hear also from, from your, your interventions, that this is not a time where we can go neutral. We have to work more. And this is where more abuse can be conducted in terms of uh, corruption and misuse of the funds that are being spent. So more than ever, our work becomes relevant and more than ever, we have to work together in addressing it. There's a lot of things that I would like to address, including the work we're doing on Recommendation 24 and where this is going, but I, I wanna be mindful of time. So I will leave my, my intervention here and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you, Elisa. Yes, we hope to come back to 24 and possibly 25 um, uh, in the questions. Um, but we do have one last panelist, so I'm delighted to introduce Ivana Rossi. Ivana, you're going to tell us about the International Monetary Fund and what the IMF's approach to all these uh, yeah, interventions is and its particular more active role around BOT. Ivana. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the invitation. We're very honored to be part of uh, this panel today. Um, so I'm gonna try to be as brief as possible to describe the work that we have been doing um, and to frame the work that we started doing during the pandemic in this particular issue. I think very briefly, I want to comment on the work that we have already been doing on anti-money laundering. Uh, actually, for, uh, the IMF has been working on anti-money laundering and uh, countering the financing of terrorism for the last 20 years and most of that work supporting the implementation of 
the FATF standards that Elisa was discussing uh, as a recognition that, you know, AML CFD issues are key for financial stability, which is a co key component of the work of the IMF. Um, then two years and a half ago, I think now it's becoming a lot more well known, two years and a half ago, our board, our executive board of the IMF uh, adopted an enhanced policy on how to address governance and anti-corruption issues in the IMF engagements. And that really uh, created a new uh, way of approaching these topics in the work that the IMF does. And uh, this policy is also part of that recognition that, you know, um, sustain if you want to promote sustainable and inclusive economic growth, you really need to tackle these topics too. Um, so anti-money laundering and anti-corruption governance issues are present in all of our work from the typical surveillance that is called Article 4 process to programs and capacity development, et cetera. Um, so this, there, is, there was already a recognition that this work is critical for the IMF. But the pandemic, of course, <laughs> increased that level of criticality even further, because of course the risk that we were facing, uh, you know, the role of the governments was changing. Uh, the pandemic forced us to rethink about a lot of things uh, and how to approach it. Also because we had an unprecedented number of countries requesting emergency financing to tackle COVID-19 uh, challenges. Uh, so by now, since March until now, over 70 countries have received um, emergency financing, uh, which is a very particular type of financing and also presented some challenges that we had to take into consideration. We knew countries needed this urgent support, uh, but at the same time, we wanted to make sure that these resources were going to be used for the intended purposes and would reach those that are that truly need it. Um, so how do you balance that need to act very quickly, but at the same time, make sure that you have some kind of a safeguard that these funds are really going to the right place. So um, as a result of that thinking and, you know, within the framework that I was describing before, um, this idea of spend as much as you need, but keep the receipts, you know, that you've all somehow mentioned, um, we started trans translating it into concrete practices, which are what we call internally, you know, the governance safeguards. Um, of course, the one that we're discussing today is particularly the one that we had in terms of uh, encouraging countries to commit to publishing not only uh, the contracts uh, related to public procurement in the, in the pandemic, but also uh, requesting and publishing the uh, beneficial owners of the companies that are engaged in public procurement. This was a measure that approximately 55% of the countries that received emergency funding committed to. But we had other measures that, uh, you know, for instance, 84% of the countries have commitments in governance. And, you know, for instance, uh, Nigeria was mentioning the, the, the commitment to have all independent audits published, you know, 72% of the countries that received emergency funding um, committed to that particular measure too. So, you know, I can, we have a lot of publications on this work that I can provide later on, but trying to zoom in particularly on the issue of beneficial ownership um, procurement, going very quickly to the rationale, you know, for this, um, we knew that with this increased uh, role of the government having to really go support people and, you know, firms and the public financing, the public finances of countries really worsening, you had to stop leakages, you had to really be mindful of not having any wasted res public resources. And we also knew that the pandemic was highly increasing the procurement expenditure. So we wanted to focus on proc procurement transparency per se, and it was also a commitment that was by itself, a commitment that countries um, did in their, in their emergency funding, approximately 60% of the countries request committed to publishing procurement contracts more openly. Um, but we wanted to go one step further because exactly we know how important it is to really know who's behind the companies that are uh, part, being part of that procurement process, who are really governments contracting with. Uh, and this is why we took this new approach and we tried to encourage that one step further of connecting the dots between the procurement side and really knowing this is always a high risk, uh, you know, activity. It involves trillions of dollars a year. Uh, with the pandemic, this was even more, uh, you know, we know procurement transparency is a key tool to try to minimize corruption risks. And at the same time, the issue of beneficial ownership, we were trying 
trying to connect these dots in this particular measure. And by trying to connect these dots, we were also trying to achieve things, you know, Elisa was mentioning before, the FATF has had a definition of beneficial ownership since 2003. Uh, but, you know, and the recent leaks have really brought this topic into a more, more, a much more mainstream discussion, you know, that we're all aware. But at the same time, for many years, this became a very technical concept that, you know, the people that were only working on anti-money laundering were familiar with, you know, the, you know, knowing the standard that needs to be applied in customer due diligence in a bank. So um, the idea was that, you know, let's try to move on, you know, let's try to show some of the synergies and the applications of this concept beyond the AML standard itself. Um, criminals are always trying to stay ahead of the curve and, you know, we really have to think uh, on the different ways in which you can change that. And I think the pandemic, with all the difficult situations that it's bringing, is actually bringing a change. You know, it's accelerating some of, or hopefully accelerating some of these reform processes. So we leveraged these existing frameworks of procurement transparency and anti-money laundering um, and came up with this idea of encouraging this measure, which thankfully the government also recognized as an important step. Um, and I think there's a couple of consequences from the fact, you know, now, you know, months away from, you know, as months go by and we learn more about this process, I think there's a couple of points that I'd like to see that we, we've been realizing. One is that, you know, by, by promoting this measure, we, we somehow are helping, in, at least in, in some way, to go beyond the technical concept and really strengthen this idea that beneficial ownership information is a key piece to confront a number of challenges. Uh, so really removing, removing that technical discussion and really bringing it to the forefront of, of this other part um, and, and bringing a further understanding uh, from the, of, of the concept. Uh, the second consequence that we see or you know, observation that we have from this process is that you know, by revealing the different potential benefits of, of this type of information, it also encourages countries to come up with effective mechanisms for identification of beneficial ownership in general, you know, not just for procurement. Um, then the third aspect that we, we like to highlight is that, you know, this is a one positive example of uh, maybe previously untapped synergies. You know, these are not new concepts. These frameworks were out there, but, you know, in this process, we realized how um, almost rare it was for these two things to connect. Really, procurement frameworks were not really requesting beneficial ownership information from companies. Maybe there were a, a few examples here and there of a good practice, but this was not mainstream. This was not happening as much as it needs to happen. So um, this, we thought this is a great example of a synergy that has to be you know, a lot more <laughs> exploited, uh, but there are others. And that's also a message that we want to get through, you know, beneficial ownership can be used for different challenges and there's synergies and connecting the dots that are fundamental to combat corruption and money laundering. One that I always like to mention is, you know, for instance, connecting the dots with financial disclosures from public officials, you know, and also using beneficial ownership information. So really having that view of, you know, there's a lot of synergies out there to, to use. And um, maybe the last point, because I'm trying to be very mindful of time uh, and speaking quickly, <laughs> it's um, for the IMF, you know, yes, we started, you know, this work particularly uh, on this particular measure in the pandemic and with our emergency funding. But we are, think we are of course, every day thinking of that recovery that lies ahead and how that recovery needs to be fair uh, for everyone and anti-corruption and anti-money laundering are, are you know, building blocks of a fair recovery. Um, and uh, so our efforts are not going to stop with emergency financing and the commitments we have there. And we already started really translating this into the more standard multi-year financing arrangements uh, as part of, of those arrangements of those longer term programs, which by being also longer term and not a one-off like emergency finding, financing, um, it really uh, um, allows us to address these issues uh, with more depth and, you know, really tackle, you know, the, poor, the, the governance aspects and the anti-corruption aspects and the anti-modernal aspects um, with a better framework to say it somehow. So these are the brief points I wanted to at least share um, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ivana. We've just got a few more minutes, so it's difficult to try to get all the questions in. 
but I think that um, a couple of very interesting lines are emerging um, um, around change moments. So we've seen um, an important change moment in Armenia with a new government that's come in and gotten behind a transparency agenda in a profound way. And we see a pandemic um, lifting some of the um, the impediments that we've seen over time to um, change, changing the pace, changing the demand that we have for reform, and also kind of forcing us to take a bit more of a bird's eye view on how things fit together. So not compartmentalizing reform, Eduardo brought that up, but then I think um, starting this second part of the conversation in Nigeria and ending it with the IMF, looking at the very powerful lever that procurement can bring to this issue around beneficial ownership and um, company ownership information, and really um, using the two to leverage each other to a more transparent uh, and an accountable place uh, for, for our societies. So that's a bit of a, a weave through of some really important contributions. We don't have a lot of time, but I would like to throw out to the floor um, a couple of questions. We've got three people that I'd like to call on. Actually, I've got four. I'm going to start with Vaslav Prusa. If you could be very quick, we're just going to get the question out and then we're going to go back to the group. Vastav, are you able to unmute yourself? Not sure if he's still there. Um, Lakshmi, Lakshmi Kumar, are you there? Oh, yes. Who's speaking, please? Um, yeah, uh, this is Lakshmi Kumar here. Lakshmi, could you just state your question, thank you. Um, no, thank you so much, uh, Robin. So, you know, with the um, with the pandemic, we're also sort of seeing this, this the increase in sort of corruption related um, activities. And I'm sort of curious of how do you see deep seated systemic and institutional corruption, one affecting the efficacy of bio registries as a solution, but also consequently, um, what does systemic and institutional corruption have to do with the abuse of beneficial ownership registries? Um, I, I, I really appreciate the panelists' um, input on those, those two perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Lachmi. And quickly, I'd like to turn, just so we can get another question, to Philip Mutio. Philip, I think you're from Transparency International. Yes, thank you very much, Robin, and good evening from Nairobi. Um, just uh, wanting to find out uh, what role or how, uh, from Elisa actually, I wanted uh, just to find out uh, how the civil society can be more involved in the two processes. We know that BO, working for BO and uh, ensuring public register, our government is working very hard to do that, but there's a lot more room for improvement as we have heard from all the colleagues, uh, from all the speakers here. But I wanted just to hear from Elisa, what is uh, FATF doing to ensure that civil societies are not excluded from these processes which seem very technical? As I have been involved in one of the uh, uh, training processes for civil societies from communities and grassroots on just understanding the processes that uh, we are going through now, the mutual evaluation review and the national risk assessment task force, which was set up here, but. Uh, the civil society seems not to have their feet in, just to be thank able you, to Philip. give them. Philip, thank you. I think the question's clear. I really apologize for, for cutting you off, but we've got another one, um, a final one that's directed particularly at um, Clem. If Hasfat Mustafa is there, and then we'll do a last round of a minute for each. Well, perhaps I'll pose it just for issues of time. I apologize to the audience that we don't have more time to come to you for questions, but Hasbat put a lot of questions into the chat. So I want to give at least one some uplift and that is to say, how do ministers and how, how do people in, in political roles tackle the challenges of building engagement around politically exposed persons? Maybe some of you could comment on that. Um, we'll go back to the group. Um, I don't know if, if Clem is still there and can speak. Minister Akbar. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Robin. Uh, the issue on how we... Uh, ...process and to ensure there are no conflict of interest 
uh, like we said, uh, from uh, Nigeria. First, we have about 16 commitments in, in, in NAP2. Mm -hmm. And uh, of these uh, commitments, we, we have uh, commitments around revenue transparency, uh, budgeting and auditing, contracting, and then beneficial uh, ownership. Around this, again, we have what we call the code of conduct, which uh, politically exposed uh, persons uh, would have to, to do. The law is very, very clear. Uh, we would, I just spoke about the beneficial ownership uh, uh, these three are tied uh, uh, together to ensure that there is uh, transparency and that uh, the politically exposed uh, uh, persons, uh, if they should, uh, should lie, uh, the, the common law uh, provides for a two-year uh, jail term. We also have other investigative and intelligence uh, uh, agencies like the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit to monitor information that have been uh, provided. I know there was a question around how civil society uh, could be included in all of this. I think OGP provides that, uh, that forum because like you know, uh, it's a co-creation uh, partnership. Uh, in our steering committee, for instance, we have about uh, 10 members from the civil society that are involved in the implementation of these uh, 16 commitments. In fact, the 16 commitments that we had, they were also involved in the development of it. So the civil society are very, very much uh, involved uh, in all of this. Just uh, to allow us to uh, speak, let me stop from here. Thank you, Clem. I apologize to all that we're running over, but I would like to give the panelists each a chance to either respond to a question or, or make a last comment. And so in sort of reverse order, I'm going to come um, back to Ivana first. Thank you so much. Um, so, I mean, I don't have, a, I, I didn't get a question for me directly, but I think if I would have to respond to some of the issues that were mentioned in the chat that, that I was quickly looking at, um, I think from the IMF perspective, we're engaging in candid dialogues with the governments, you know, to really have these discussions and see which are the areas for reform that can be pushed and that can be um, agreed on. And we also, you know, to make sure that, you know, the technical aspects and the way that beneficial ownership, you know, registers or any other measure that we're promoting in terms of anti-money laundering governance or anti-corruption, uh, we provide technical assistance. You know, we work with the governments also in the implementation of these measures and guiding them when they have challenges or, or questions. Um, and then also always keeping in mind this idea that all the measures that we are discussing with the governments and that we're promoting through our work uh, have this concept of the synergies, you know, really understanding that you cannot, you will not solve all of these issues with one measure. You need to think about those synergies. And of course, all the partnerships, uh, you know, we work extensively with governments, but we think the partnership with civil society and with other actors are fundamental to keep this momentum of change, to achieve that fairer recovery. Um, so, you know, those are, you know, I'm happy to discuss in another forum, but, you know, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, and for this discussion that is so important. Thank you, Ivana. It's hard to believe that 90 minutes went by that quickly, but I am going to come back to Elisa de Ande Madrazo. Thank you, Robin, and thank you for the invitation. As it might, this might be my last uh, participation. So uh, thank you very much for the question. You're totally right. Civil engagement, private sector engagement is key. And the FATF has realized this. We started by working with the governments and we soon realized that we had to work with the private sector and the civil society. And this is because anti-money laundering and country terrorist financing is not a crime without victims. We're talking about having better societies. We're talking about money that comes from a crime, but that will also fuel more crimes if it gets laundered. And once we take this technicality out of the conversation and we talk about societies and lives, then you get engagement. And then you can go across that technicality and actually sum up. You have to move away from a technical approach. We have to let financial institutions and DNFPPs, which are the non-financial uh, um, light entities know that they can actually prevent crimes. So when they do their work, they're not looking to avoid a sanction by the supervisor or just checking a list. They're following common instinct. When they know when an accountant, a lawyer, a notary know that something is tricky, something is obscure, that they need to report it. And report it is not saying that there's a crime. It's saying there's something suspicious because only the authority by having all the information might notice that there is something uh, 
bigger going on or a network going on. So that is what we're trying to do. And that's why I am here and we're having more engagement with the, with the society in general and partner organizations. We're gonna have a conversation on this specific topic that will include the private sector and will include potential changes to our recommendation 24 on the 24th of this month. So I, I do take this opportunity to, to put it out there and to invite partner organizations to approach the FATF, not only through the government they work with, but directly as we are very open and keen on working with the private sector. I would leave it there. Thank you very much for the, for the engagement. And I hope this is not the first and the last. I'm sorry, I hope this is not the last one. Thank you. I doubt it will be, Elisa. If we can um, bother you to follow up with the whole group of attendees to tell us about how to access that, um, that consultation, as well as the document you referenced that was uh, published at the last end of last year with best case examples. Eduardo, I'm leaning on you to give us a reality check on, on a lot of these promises. How do you see things? Wrap, wrap us up. There is a very good question from Bakla Prusa you know, in, the, in the chat. Uh, and I fully agree, we don't have enough evidence about the impact and uh, efficiency of beneficial ownership registers because we don't have them. You know? But um, we have the same paradox with access to information laws uh, in the 90s. No? We, we were discussing the potential of this access to information laws because we, we didn't have any of them. Now we know the limits of access to information and the potential of access to information. But I, I, I agreeing with, with WACLAP, I will strongly say that uh, we need to, to prove that these tools work and this, this has to be our aim. No? These, are, these are tools, just tools. No? And the possible effects have to be addressed when we evaluate them in terms of the results. Uh, let's, let's try to avoid making uh, this, this kind of mean into an end. No? Having a beneficial ownership register is not the end. It's just the tool for a bigger end that we have been discussing. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll thank again everyone to, uh, to allow me to be part of this conversation and especially the organizers. Firstly, I want to thank all of the panelists today. As the world's leading experts on beneficial ownership transparency, it's so reassuring to see collective action being discussed and taken on this vital issue. It's important to hear from political leadership on this, and I thank the UK, Armenia and Nigeria for joining us. Thanks also to the Financial Action Task Force Vice President Elisa De Ander and the IMF Savana Rossi for sharing what their respective organisations are doing to continue to advance these reforms. Both FATF and the IMF are crucial levers in delivering beneficial ownership transparency, and I really welcome their commitment to continue engagement with the broadest range of people in that discussion. Finally, I'd like to thank Eduardo Bajorquez for reinforcing the critical role civil society plays in maintaining pressure for reform. And then of course, realizing the benefits of beneficial ownership disclosure by using the data. As he rightly pointed out, beneficial ownership disclosure is not the end. It's a critical starting point for achieving many of our shared goals on transparency and accountability. We heard three important themes from all of our speakers today. The first is that reforms must be done by taking people with you. Open ownership through the leadership group and other forums is building broad coalition to make beneficial ownership a reality. This must include everyone in government. Beneficial ownership disclosure is critical for tackling fundamental challenges all governments face, addressing money laundering and corruption, and critically enabling better, cleaner public procurement by showing where public money really ends up. Businesses must come along on that journey too. There is no good reason why any business, big or small, should struggle to access the basic information they need to perform due diligence and trade safely. Civil society must be part of this too, as well as the media and journalists who often risk their lives to expose the corruption we know flows from opaque companies. Finally, all citizens have a stake in this and engaging widely and constructively with as many parts of society as possible will be essential not only for delivering the reforms, but delivering them really well. My second takeaway is about how we collectively deliver beneficial ownership transparency effectively. The gap between strong commitment and effective action is still too big. That's why open ownership exists, to be the global hub of learning and expertise on how to deliver beneficial ownership reforms in a way that works for everyone. 
The leadership group is a critical space for sharing that knowledge, and we encourage more governments to step forward and commit to meeting the standards that other members are seeking to achieve and working with us to ensure we all understand how to do this well. Finally, beneficial ownership reform does not exist in a vacuum. We are working in extremely challenging circumstances to deliver pioneering reforms in this space, and we must respond and show that we are responding to the challenges we face today. Beneficial ownership reform sits at the heart of building back better. Let's get this done. So I think I'd like to thank everybody on the panel for a really rich conversation. Again, I apologize for the poor uh, cheering which brought us over the, the, uh, the 90 minutes. But I think I'd sum up by saying that this issue matters and that we've seen it perhaps even rise in relevance given the critical way that we're able to now talk about it possibly in less technical terms and more about how it affects people and how it can have a really um, concrete impact on how we're spending our emergency funding and on the conflicts of interest that can get in the way of good spending and um, really the economic uh, recovery that's gonna be so critical for people, for livelihoods uh, coming out of the pandemic. And we've heard that um, the timing is now, and we've also heard we need to implement and show impact, uh, evidence and impact. So I think with that, I'll, I'll leave you and hope that this isn't the last time we hear from um, countries and experts and organizations that are behind this issue. And we come back and report to each other about progress and we look for opportunities to advance that progress together. Thanks everybody and bye-bye. <laughs>